I want to talk to you real quick. So I was in, when I was in college, um, it was this era in which in the late 90s where all of a sudden I was in business school and all of a sudden someone came up with this idea in the business world, everything needs to be a team project. Everything. Like I, I get to school and I'm like, I got this, I'm doing this. And we find out like every class I had was, okay, group project, group project, group project. I don't, somebody in the business world somewhere had employees who were terrible except for like three, and so they just put them in groups. I don't really know how this worked. But you get in this group, anyone ever been in a group project? Right? So we get put in these group projects, and you, get a, you start to look around at who you get assigned, and you just wonder like, okay, how much work am I going to have to do this time? You know what I'm saying? Like you get in that project, and you have these people, and you know this one person, you're like, yeah, they're not going to do anything, right? Uh, I was in a group project once, and there was this gal who was, amazing but she like really had control issues so she just wanted to do the whole thing I'm like Psh, okay and we got an A plus on that one it's awesome but for the most part you get in these things and you're just like how much am I gonna have to do and sometimes in a group project if you ever experience this you just carry the whole thing on your back you ever had that happen to you where you're like nobody did anything or they pretended to and you're getting out there I remember I was doing this presentation once in this class and I, I don't know I was doing some business presentation and I got to do the presentation, and I've got my teammates with me, and I'm giving the presentation, I'm realizing, like, I did 95% of this project. Not because I had con wanted control of it, right? Now, I, I have that as an issue some other times, but that's beside the point. I wanted help. I wanted help. And everybody, we got a good grade, and I was like, this isn't fair. I did all of it, and they benefited from it. Oh, my goodness. Well, here's the deal. God gave humanity a group project, and we totally messed it up. <laughs> right? Jesus did the whole thing for us. He just did all the work. Like, he, he did, like, we got put in this group with Jesus, and he did it all. And we, we didn't, we got an A because of it. And I want to talk to you about what Jesus does as he awakens us in our authority. We, we have been included with what Christ has done. And so we're going to dig into Hebrews. We're in chapter two today. Chapter two. In chapter one of Hebrews, uh, we talked last week about the name of Jesus, and this book of Hebrews, the author is trying to help these early Christians, these early Jewish Christians. So this was in the early 60s, the 0060 60s, and, and so there's persecution happening. These Christians, these Jews who become Christians are getting all this persecution, and many of them were feeling like it'd just be easier to go back and become Jewish again, return to Judaism, because the pressure is way less, because our neighbors won't hate us, our, our family won't disown us, Nero won't kill us, all these things that are happening, and so he's trying to help them stick true to Jesus, because he's the only way, and so he's setting up some things for us in this book, and in chapter one, he focused on the divinity of Jesus. He was showing that Jesus was more than a good man, he was more than a good prophet, he is the image of God, the word of God, and the son of God. And so this chapter one focuses on Jesus' divinity, while chapter two focuses on his humanity. His humanity. You know, the very first false teaching, you ever heard false teachings before about Jesus? You ever met anyone and they say, well, this is why I don't go to church, and they tell you something about God or Jesus, and you're like, I don't know where you learned that. that is, you're so far off. But there's false teachings, and, and even in the early church, there were false teachings. And, and we read about how, like, they, they were accusing the disciples of stealing his body and that he didn't really raise from the dead. He wasn't really God. The first false teaching in the church wasn't about uh, questioning whether or not Jesus was divine, whether he was God. There was no question. There was a, a heresy called docetism, which means to seem in the Greek. And docetism claimed that Jesus wasn't actually human. That was the fir very first false teaching in the church. Jesus wasn't really human. He only seemed human the way that the angelic messengers in the Old Testament sometimes appeared to be human, and they appeared in human form. And so in chapter 2, this is a thesis on Jesus is actually God in the flesh. He actually became human. And so this is going to be a two-part sermon. Next week, we're going to look at the second part of Hebrews 2. But today, we'll start with verse 1, Hebrews 2, verse 1. So we start here. It says, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable... And every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? He's, he's basically saying, 
if you look at the Old Testament and there was consequences, how much more there's still consequences to what God's doing today. It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So just a side note here. This is, this is the first of many, many pleas in the book of Hebrews. And we, didn't, we see this the first time in Hebrews 2. He's urging these believers, don't neglect such a great salvation. It didn't just come as a message on paper. It wasn't somebody's idea. Somebody just didn't have a dream, and all of a sudden there was a new religion born. This, this salvation came by signs and wonders and miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit. It came in power, and you saw it come in power. And the good news is God is still at work when he's writing this to the church. God is still at work. He's still bringing his message through signs and wonders and mirac- miracles and gifts of the Spirit. And church, he's still doing it today. He's still doing it today, and salvation is still being found all over the world. Did you know that in many parts of the world, outside of of America, many parts of the world, you are seeing revivals where people are being miraculously healed. You're seeing crazy miracles like legs growing and bones healing and and cancer disappearing. You're seeing all over the world the miracles of God still at work and happen in a people that are desperate for God, desperate for a touch from God. And the salvation of the Lord is coming because Jesus said that when we go and preach the gospel, these signs will follow. And so we're seeing this still to this day. So this is not an ideology. This is a salvation that the Lord gave to us. And so the author of Hebrews wants them to hang on to that and not go back to the old ways. Not go back to the old ways. Because, and he mentions here, there will be a future judgment at the end times. There's actually a lot of end times talk right here in our section today. We're going to get to that. There's a future judgment at the end times, but not for those who stay true to the great salvation that's given by Jesus. This matters as we read the rest of our text because God had an eternal plan for mankind. Did you know that? It wasn't just a plan for Adam and Eve. God had a plan for mankind that was an eternal plan that we are included in. A plan that we messed up, but Jesus redeemed. So let's take a look at what this plan is in verse 5. We'll go 5 through 11. It says, for it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him for a who a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Verse 10, For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified, for he who sanctifies Jesus, for those who are sanctified, us, all have one source, or the word also in there is Father. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. We'll stop there for today. God's plan. Let's talk about God's plan for creation. This is, this is incredible when you really look at what God's plan is. God had a plan for you and for me, and it's simple. God planned for humans to have dominion over the earth. That's his plan for us. He created us to have the world be subject to us, to be under our control. And it says in Genesis, we'll go all the way back to creation, in Genesis chapter 1, if you want to look at what God's plan was from the beginning of time, the very first book of the Bible is a great place to go. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, it says, And God blessed them, them being Adam and Eve. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on earth. And in the same way, the author of Hebrews tells us that God did not leave this world for angels to rule it, but for mankind, like we see in Genesis 1.28. When you think about what God has given us to do. So he pulls a section right out of Scripture, and I think it's kind of funny. He says, it has been testified somewhere. Now, if this writing... You know, our Bibles have been given headings and chapters and names and verses, not at this time. So he's quoting Old Testament scripture, and it is a direct 
quote from Psalm chapter 8. This little section in your Bible, if you see in your Bible how it's written out differently, if you brought a paper Bible, hopefully you have paper Bible, bring a paper Bible to church. If you look in your Bible, you'll see that it's not just paragraph form, it's written kind of like po a poem in your, in your text. It's an excerpt right out of Psalm chapter 8, verses 4 through 6. So if we were, we'd go there, and we won't do that right now for the sake of time, but you can fact check me later. Psalm 8, 4 through 6 is right here in Hebrews chapter 2. Now in this psalm, this is written by David, and David is declaring God's purpose for mankind. God's purpose for mankind. His purpose is that even though we were made a little lower than the angels, he says, we were crowned with glory and honor, and everything is subjected, is in subjection under his feet. This is what God designed for us. That's what God designed for you and for me, to be the boss. To be, now, some of you don't have a hard time with that. Some of you don't have a hard time being the boss. Some of you don't have a hard time being in charge in your home. And, uh, and maybe someone in your home even calls you bossy from now and then. You can just look at them and say, look, I'm walking in God's plan for my life. <laughs> it's God's design. You got to be careful what you're bossy over. But this is God's intention for us. This is what God designed for us. Right out of Psalm 8, you made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. God created us to walk in authority. It's in you. It's inherently in the heart of every man. If you go back again to Genesis, you would see that God gave Adam a job at the very beginning. You remember the first job that God gave Adam? Does anyone remember? He named the animals. He said, here's all the animals. You name them. You name them, right? If you have a new child, who gets to name the child? The parent or the child itself, right? <laughs> the one who has authority in that child's life, right? And so the Adam is given authority right away over the animals. And God says, you name them. You decide what they're going to be called. You tell them what their names are. And so this is an example right off the bat of God creating man to walk in authority. Man will have dominion over the world, and the world will be subject to man. And God did this for a specific purpose. There was a purpose for us to be an authority over the world. And that was so that we would govern the earth on God's behalf. That he, gave the, he created the world, and he wanted us to govern it on his behalf. Now, if you look around your world today, and the governance that's happening around the world you would say that there are a lot of men and women in our world that are definitely not governing the world on God's behalf. Do you see it? Do you see that anywhere in our world? you see any corruption anywhere? Do you see anybody that you're like, this is surely not God's behalf? But God had this plan that we would govern the world on his behalf and that we would be crowned in glory and honor as a reflection of God to the earth. And the world would actually be ruled by God, but through us. This was his design. That it would be ruled by God through us and that we would reflect his glory on earth. Now, as Christians today, we have that calling and we have that assignment to reflect the glory of God on earth. But we've got to go back again to the book of Genesis. And we're not going to, you guys know the story, I think. And so we'll just recap. Man failed. Man failed. God had a plan, but man failed. We look in verse 8 here in Hebrews 2, it says that God did all these things. He put in subjection under his feet, but it says, at present we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Why? Why don't we see everything in subjection to man? Because man failed. We failed. God's plan could only be decided, could only be, uh, could only be fulfilled by those who refused to decide what good and evil was for themselves. If you are going to have authority over the earth, if we're going to govern the earth, if we're going to fulfill God's original plan for mankind, it had to be done by people who allowed God to determine what was good and evil. And yet, we decided what is good and evil for ourselves, and once humans rebelled, all claims on God's plan were lost. Done. Over. Sin ruined everything. Have you ever seen that story play out in your life? Sin ruins everything. It ruined everything. And so Adam and Eve, they essentially did this. If they had dominion, God said, here's dominion. I want you to be in charge of the earth and rule over it. And Satan came and deceived them. And they were like, oh, okay, you go ahead and take it from me. And we handed our dominion, we handed our dominion over to Satan. 
so that he would now rule. That's why Jesus actually referred to Satan several times as the prince of this world. Because we had been given something that we gave up. And now we have, because of our failure, now Satan causes wreckage on the earth, all over. Paul talks about it, that the world was subject to frustration, that it is subject to decay because of sin. And so what happened? Man and our failure, mankind's failure, forfeited our ability to fulfill God's plan for our creation. Just think about that. Without Jesus, God had a plan. Can you imagine? Like, think of the disappointment there. God had a plan for us, and because of sin, because of our failure, we have forfeited our ability to fulfill God's plan for creation. It's completely forfeited. You don't get it back. This is the way until Jesus. And it was at this point that we became subject to death. We weren't subject to death. Adam and Eve were not subject to death before this, before they decided for themselves what good and evil would be. You see, in Genesis 3.22, you can go look into Genesis 3.22, we see where God actually removes them from the garden so that they would not eat from the tree of life and live forever. Because he's merciful. Because God knows that if you are going to live in sinful flesh, it's torture to have to live in sin forever and ever and ever. And so there, there is a point at which we will die to this world and to these bodies. God is merciful enough to not let us live forever in these sinful bodies. And so here we have this issue now that's been caused that needs a solution. The writer of Hebrews says, at present we do not yet see everything in subjection to him because of man's failure. But, he says, we see Jesus. But we see Jesus. Here's the good news. Jesus redeemed it. Jesus is redeemed and is redeeming God's actual plan for mankind. This is where the author makes the biggest claim the biggest claim. He says, Jesus has become the son of man that David wrote about. You see, David was writing about God's plan for mankind, but Jesus has now stepped into Psalm chapter 8, and he has become the son of man. And so this, this explanation that David gives has now become a prophecy of what Jesus would do, that he would redeem it all. You see, Jesus was the son of man in in uh, Psalm 8, it, he was also, what was he done? He made lower than the angels, right? Jesus was made lower than the angels for a little while, it says. He has been crowned with glory and honor, and everything has been subjected to Jesus. He has fulfilled this purpose for mankind when he came and walked this earth. You see, Jesus had to become human because God intended to put the world in subjection to man, not spiritual beings. He had to become human to fulfill God's plan. God wanted man to rule and reign. If Jesus simply stayed in heaven and ruled and reigned as the Son of God from heaven, then God's promise to put the world under subjection to man, as we see in Psalm chapter 8, it would be untrue. And God does not lie. You realize that, right? That God does not lie? He does not lie. And so if he says, my plan is that the world will be subjected to man, it's going to take man to come and redeem what's been broken. And so Jesus couldn't just reign in heaven. He had to come as a man. He had to step into earth, step out of heaven, take on flesh. And when Jesus came to earth, get this, he didn't stop being a spiritual being. That is God. Now, he did lay down his divinity, his use of it while on earth. If you go to Philippians 2, I'm going fast because there's so much here. Philippians 2, go through to Philippians 2, write that in your notes, look it up later, 6 through 8. It says that Jesus was still God when he walked on earth, but that he laid down his rights to his divine nature. He laid down his rights to that. So when he ministered, he ministered as a man in the flesh, full of the Holy Spirit of God. He came as a man. He didn't use to his advantage the things of God. See, Jesus, can you imagine when the crowds were coming around Jesus, if he was just a, I don't know about you, but do you ever get like claustrophobic in giant crowds or you just feel like they're crushing me? Like if Jesus would not have laid down his divine, uh, not his divine nature, but his rights to his divinity on earth, then he could have just like teleported to another spot where there were no people and they could have left him alone. He could have done whatever he wanted because he's God, but he didn't. He stayed man in the flesh. 
And so we have human nature that was added to his divine nature. And you need to, that's important because D Jesus didn't ever stop being God. He just also became man. And now he is forever man and God for eternity. He rules as God and he rules as man. You see, Jesus came and by giving his life, it says here, by giving his life, laying his life down through his suffering, he redeemed God's original plan as a man in the flesh. That's important. He, re he redeemed God's original plan, not as God himself, as a man in the flesh. Man in the flesh. He defeated the consequences of mankind's failure. What were the consequences? Death. There was a consequence of death. And so, because we failed. We can't rule and reign. We're going to die. How can we, as mankind, rule and reign forever when we only live so many years? It can't happen. And so Jesus came, and he overcame death, and he overcame the grave. And now he lives forevermore. Jesus essentially took the whole group project, put it on his back, and carried us. That's why the Apostle Paul can say in Ephesians 1.21, I mentioned last week that he is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. That's who he is. So, while we do not yet, say yet, that's an important word here. While we, the author is pointing to some event in the future, while we do not yet, we don't yet see everything under man's control at the present time. He says we do see Jesus, and in him we find the key to man's eventual rule over the earth. This is good news for you and for me, because God has some authority that he wants to awaken in you today, because he has a plan for our future. In verse 8b, we see here where it says, um, we don't see everything in subjection yet, but we see him, Jesus, crowned with glory and honor. And then it says in verse 10 that it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. And then he goes on and says that is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. You see, we have a future with Jesus. How can the God of heaven who is not a man, call us a brother. He can't. But as a man in the flesh, he says, we have the same father now, and you are my brothers. When Jesus returns, I have good news for you. You know Jesus is coming back? You know that? He's coming back. And if you start to look around the events of the world, you start to wonder, is this going to be soon? Right? Do you wonder that sometimes? I don't know the day or the hour. Neither does Jesus, apparently, according to Scripture. Only the Father knows. But if you look at the signs and you look at what's happening, you, it, it should bring into your mind, into your thoughts, okay, Jesus is coming back. And when he returns, this is our future. When Jesus returns, we'll see his full authority right before our eyes. It will not be limited in any way, shape, or form. And here's the good news. We won't just sit back and watch Jesus rule and reign. By redeeming mankind's dominion, Jesus invites us to rule and reign with him. Jesus invites us to rule and reign with him. Because he came, became a human like us, he can call us brothers. We are sanctified by the one who has been sanctified. We join with him, calling God the Father. Jesus actually includes you in the fulfillment of Psalm chapter 8. That this is now your future. This is your identity. That you were made for a little while Lower than the angels, you'll be crowned with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. This is God's plan for mankind, to come and rule and reign with him. And Jesus redeemed that because he became a human like us. Because he became a human like us, we are his brothers. And when Jesus returns, we will join him. We will join with him in taking back dominion over the earth. This is good news. Revelation chapter 5. If you want to see what's going to happen at the end, Revelation's the place to go. The angels declare out in Revelation 5, 9, through 9 and 10. It says, and they sang, the angels, a new song saying, you are worthy. They're speaking to Jesus. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain 
And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. Church, you have been purchased from every tribe and language and nation and people on earth. And you have made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve our God. And they will reign on the earth. You will reign on the earth. You will reign with Jesus on the earth. When he returns, we're going to join with him in reigning on the earth. Listen, you're not going to in eternity be sitting on a cloud and playing a harp. I mean, maybe that's your assignment. Maybe you do play harp and you're like, Jesus, that's what I want to do. And maybe you will play a harp as you will be singing out worship to God as the armies of God go forward. But for most people, that's not going to be your destiny. That you are going to sit on a cloud and hover and play a harp. That's not it. No, you are going to rule and reign. You are going to kick butt and take names in the end of times. That is our destiny in Jesus. That's how it works. This is what he has for us. This is why the idea, it, it, for some reason as Christians, we get so worried that the church is going to die and that, that the, the church is going to be destroyed and shrink back. No, in the end, the church rises up and the church defeats the powers of darkness and the church takes dominion back. And as a church, if we just start shrinking back and getting scared and getting weak, we're not preparing for the future that God has for us in eternity. Because he wants us to practice now ruling and reigning over what he gives us in a measure so that there will be a fullness of it later. You will walk in the full authority that God has always intended for you. It is your destiny in Jesus. It will happen. Whether you like to be in charge or not. <laughs> Listen, when you are reigning with Jesus, you will have the full authority. This is your destiny in Jesus, to take back dominion from Satan. That's your destiny in Jesus. He will return, we will reign with him, and it says that he will reign, that Satan will be bound and he will reign for a millennium, for a thousand years. You will rule and reign with Jesus, and we will take back dominion from Satan. He will have no authority, he will have no control, he will have no influence. Isn't that good news? And you get to reign and be with Jesus. You get to be in an army that is guaranteed a victory. That's a good one to be in. That is a good one to be in. In Matthew chapter 25, here's the thing I want you to know. You, you don't just, I want to encourage you and challenge you. Don't just be content in your life with saying, well, I believed in Jesus. I punched the ticket. I'm going to heaven. It's going to be okay. Th th you, you want that, by the way. <laughs> you want to know where you're going when you die. You want to know where you sit in eternity. But Christians... Church, brothers and sisters, God wants to prepare you now to begin to walk in the fullness of authority that he has for you later. He wants to prepare you to rule and reign now for ruling and reigning with him later. In Matthew 25, we see Jesus talking. This whole chapter, Matthew 25, Jesus is talking about the end times. And we see him talking about the end times in this first section and in the last section. In the middle section, there's this little paragraph and that we call the parable of the talents. And what happens is each person is given a measure of something and is told to do something with it, to steward it in the here and the now. And when the master comes back and says, how did you steward what I've given you? There were two that said, I, I took what you, you gave me and I stewarded it well, and, and here's, here's more. I've grown with it. I've done with it. One of them did nothing with it. The two that stewarded what God gave them, here's what he said to them. He said, you have been faithful over little, I will set you over much. He's talking about the end times. When you are faithful in the little that God has given you here, when you are faithful in walking as an authority now, he will set you over much, kings and kingdoms and dominions. And right now, God is preparing us Jesus is preparing his brothers and his sisters. That's you. He's preparing his brothers and his sisters to fulfill God's original plan again. This plan in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 that we totally messed up, that we totally lost, we gave away our claims to. Mankind will never be able to rule the earth now, never be able to have dominion. And Jesus comes and he says, I'm preparing you to go fulfill what God originally intended from the beginning of time. From the beginning of this earth, he 
designed that man would rule and reign over the earth and reflect the glory of God. And when Jesus returns, church, it's going to happen again without limit. But you got to get ready now for what he has for you later because God will give you a measure of authority now to prepare you for your destiny later. He gives you a measure of authority. He gives you... I said we prayed for some people last week. A couple people got healed. We're going to keep praying that people will be healed. Sometimes I pray for someone and they don't get healed. I, I wish they did. And sometimes I don't understand it. But I know that God's given me a measure of authority, and I'm going to keep walking in whatever measure of authority he's given me, and I'm going to keep pressing in, and I'm going to keep asking, and I'm going to keep pushing down back the things of darkness. And when in my life I'm seeing patterns and seeing unhealthy things, like I talked about spiritual mountains a few weeks ago, I'm going to take authority over strongholds because he's given me a measure of authority now. Later in my destiny, it'll be complete authority reigning and ruling with Jesus. But church, he wants to wake you up. And he wants you to realize that you have a future to get ready for. Some of you are like, man, this world is so hard. Do you know we live right now in a very hopeless world? Who just, so many people, they just say, I don't, there's nothing to live for. There's nothing to work for. There's nothing to go for. There's nothing to look forward. Listen, Jesus wants to wake you up, church, and realize that there is a future that he wants you to get ready for. He actually wants you to begin walking in this authority that he's placed in you. He wants you to start practicing. He wants you to start speaking things out in faith. He wants you to start rising up and walking as though Jesus actually defeated the evil one and that he is with you and in you. You can walk in authority because in Jesus' name, he has all authority. And God's word tells us that Christ is in us. When we receive Christ, he is in us. He is with us. And so with Christ, we can walk in that measure of authority that he has for us. There's an awakening that some of you need to have this morning. That when we, Here's what you need to know. When we put our faith in Jesus, there's this awakening that happens in us. When you say, Jesus, I surrender my life to yours. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I have sinned. I have failed. I repent before you. Lord, forgive me. I need you, Jesus, to be my Savior. When you do that, your capacity to walk in authority, something is awakened in you. Something wakes up in you. You start to see things. If you, here's an example. Any of you ever been sinners before? <laughs> Sorry, that's a dumb question. Let me say this a little more clear. Any of you ever look in your past and went, I did some really bad, terrible things. Don't have, don't, please don't raise your hand. I don't want to know them. But you're thinking to yourself, I did some really bad things. And when I was doing them, I didn't even realize how bad they were. But when I came and received Jesus, all of a sudden, something flipped to me. And I went, oh my goodness. What, who was I? What did I, something was awakened within you. Your spirit came alive and you realized that there was a destiny greater in your life for you. There was an authority. There was a capacity awakened within you. And you realized, wait a minute, there's something more that God has for me in my life. And when that authority is awakened within us, we come to the realization, you know what? I don't have to stay under oppression anymore. And some of you haven't even realized that yet. Some of you have never come to this place where all of a sudden you just realize, wait a minute, I don't have to live depressed. I don't have to live under oppression. I don't, you mean I don't have to live in fear? Wait, are you telling me that sin doesn't have to rule my life? See, when there's an authority of Christ that's awakened within you, you come to this realization that your destiny is to rule and reign with Jesus. So we start practicing now on the little things. Trust me, kicking a bad habit is practice compared to what it's going to be like when you rule and reign with Jesus. I don't, you imagine that however you want. Think of the favorite movie with the best battle fight scene or whatever, and you're the one who wins in that scene. But you've got to train, and you've got to practice, and it begins by taking authority in the small things even now. And God wants to begin to awaken you. Some of you are living your life in believing lies. You're, you're living your life, and you're still living as though Jesus never came and redeemed what Adam and Eve did. You're living your life in which you say things like, you know what, I will never be able to lead my family. 
I guess I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough. I don't have the spiritual maturity enough. I'll never be able to lead my family. Or you'll say, I'll never be able to overcome anxiety. It's just not going to happen. I can't, I've tried. I just I can't overcome anxiety. Or maybe you'll say, I'll never stop being fearful. Or I'll never be strong enough. Or maybe some of you are saying, no, I will never be one of those courageous people. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. Because God has placed inside you a capacity to walk in the authority of Christ. He's placed it in the very heart of man. And it lays dormant as we live our lives in sin. But when we come to Christ, there's an awakening, a capacity to not live under subjection to the enemy, but to be in a place where we practice putting all things under subjection under our feet because we have Christ. Amen? We've got to wake up. God wants to awaken you, church. He wants to awaken you. Our theme this year is move mountains. You can't move mountains if you always believe that the mountain's always going to win. You can't move mountains if you believe that it's immovable. Sure, mountains are immovable. <laughs> Jesus is more powerful still. Right? The authority that is awakened within us to begin to believe. Some of you this year have come into this year and you, this theme of moving mountains has resonated with you. And yet already you're so discouraged because you look at that thing and you say, I, it just, isn't, just won't move. It just isn't going to move. I prayed for a few weeks. It won't move. I don't know. At some point, there needs to be something to arise within us, a belief that says, you know what? I have authority, Jesus said, to speak to that mountain, and it will move. I'm going to speak to that mountain. I'll, I'll keep telling that mountain every day to move if I, I need to. It's going to move. You may wake up one day and don't realize, like, you commanded something spiritually, and that physical mountain's still there. Oh, but something's moving. You just don't see it. You know that you don't see, you don't see a volcano until it erupts, but it's happening for a long time before. There's a lot of stuff happening inside that mountain before it blows up. And some of you have begun to speak things in the spirit, and there's that, that moving inside, and it's going to erupt at some point. God wants to awaken within you what he placed in the heart of man from the beginning of time. Will you stand with me? I want to pray over you this morning. I hope that today... You, you aren't just enlightened or encouraged or challenged. I hope that you are awakened. And that when you go out this week and live your life, and you go out in these things, and you get to these places where you start to believe things that are lies, you be, get to this place where you're like, I'll just never be enough. I'll never be able to do it. It's never going to work. I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not capable enough. Listen. God has placed within you a destiny to rule and reign with him. And he wants to begin to awaken that with you right now in the here and now. And church, we should be excited about the future. Our world is completely falling apart, and yet we should still be excited about the future. The world's getting harder. You know what? The training's getting more intense then. Well, it's harder to walk in authority in this world. I mean, they all hate us. Okay, great. It's even better practice now. <laughs> God is going to use us to rule and reign with him. Man, when you know how the book ends, the middle isn't so terrifying. And he has his plan for, your, for you, for me, for mankind ready to be restored. So start walking in authority. Let's pray this morning. Lord God, we come before you. And we recognize, Lord God, that you came, Jesus, to restore the heart of God for mankind. Church, I want you to pray this over yourself. Say, God, you created me to walk in authority. God, you designed me to rule and reign with you. God, prepare me for my destiny to rule with Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray right now for your church. Church, 
right now in this place, if you are in a place where you are feeling like I am feeling under, I am feeling defeated, I am feeling weak, I am feeling stuck, I am feeling like I can't walk in authority, I'm feeling like I'm never strong enough, I'm too depressed, I'm too anxious, I'm too worried, I'm too stressed, will you just come over out on the sides this morning? Our ministry team would love to pray for you today. We want to pray for you because we want to partner with you. Sometimes you need someone else to grab your hand and to agree with you and to say, you know what? Let me speak into your life what God has destined for you. And so if that's you this morning and you're struggling with this, you're struggling and saying, you know what? I, I don't feel like I've got any authority awakened within me. I don't feel like I have any authority. Over, I just keep losing to the enemy over and over and over again. Would you get prayer this morning? We want to pray with you. Because God wants you to walk in victory. To be able to say to that mountain, move. But Lord God, we come before you this morning. Awaken the authority of Jesus Christ within us. Oh God, give us the foresight. Give us the vision to see that in the future of eternity, we will rule and reign. And God, you will have us practice even now. So God, with what you've given us in front of us, the measure of what you've, some of you've given us different measures. For some, you've given families and corporations and hundreds of people to care for and to, to walk in authority over. For some, you've given us one thing to walk in authority. Maybe the only thing that we have right now to walk in authority is how we see ourselves in your eyes. And we need to stop believing the lies of the enemy. And so we take authority over those places where our mind is begin to wander and believe the lie of the enemy. We walk in that authority today. We walk in authority, Lord God, in the places in our lives where we see families that are being destroyed and lost, Lord God, and the, and the carnage and the, the casualties and the pain and the brokenness and the hurt from broken relationships, the pain. Lord, we pray for healing for those who are brokenhearted. We pray for freedom for those who have been held in captive, Lord God. We pray for deliverance for your people this morning, Lord God, that we would not be a people who walk in chains. We would not be a people who live our lives with like handcuffs on us, trying to live through our lives, but that we would be the ones who would have the handcuffs in our hand, ready to enforce your authority, ready to take in charge the, the authority over the things of this dark world. And to say, no, Jesus will reign and rule in this world. He will reign in my heart. He will reign in this situation. I will not be defined by this brokenness right now. I will not be defined by this failure. I will not be defined by what someone else said to me or did to me or tried to hurt me. This season of my life where I feel like I've got nothing to give, I won't be defined by that because I have a destiny in Jesus. And I will begin to walk in the authority of Christ that he has placed in me. I will not keep living as though it's all going to fall apart every day. This is not about positivity. This is not about the glasses half full or the glasses half empty. This is about Christ dwelling in us. And so Jesus Christ, we thank you that you came to restore the Father's plan for us and that you call us brothers and sisters, that you carried the whole project on your back and you said, now come and rule with me. Oh God, prepare us today for the glorious future that you have in store for us in the name of Jesus hallelujah if you want prayer this morning come on forward get prayed for if you want to get prayer for anything else you need healing this morning come get prayer we're going to sing this chorus together and Pastor Matt will come dismiss us in a moment